Hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I know we have people from all over the world. It's awesome. Um, before we start, we have a little quick announcement to make. CGMA is starting the fall term. Um, registration is open right now. And it goes from August 29 to October 14. So please check that out. And today we have an awesome interview. We have Marco Bucci. He's a new instructor, and he'll be teaching the art of color and light. Please be sure to check out his stuff. And um, I'm going to hand it off to you now, Marco. Sure. Thanks, Jonathan. Hello, everyone. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for, uh, thanks for coming, and I'm looking forward to a cool live chat with you guys. I just want to say off the bat, any question is valid. There are no stupid questions, so feel free to interrupt with any kind of thing, and Jonathan will graciously feel uh you know feed me some of the questions and i'll answer whatever i can sounds good cool yeah uh and, and everyone can hear me properly right it's you sound you sound you sound good okay um yeah so it's I guess, uh, as Jonathan said, the art of color and light. Uh, I begin teaching that in uh, October, so we're month, just less than a month away now. And uh, just to provide a quick background on me, uh, as a teacher, I've been I've been teaching for about ten years, and um, I've in all all different types of schools and to all different types of students, really, um, both brick and mortar schools and online schools. And uh, to all different ages, from kids to adults to even elderly folks. And it's been a real passion of mine. Um, of course, my first passion is, is an art, uh, that of an artist, but uh, just communicating concepts that other artists have been able to pass on to me. Um, I've you know, just got a, an interest in carrying on legacy of, of good learning and stuff like that. So uh, I'm happy to be here at CGMA to hopefully do that. Um, and that's why I say in earlier, any question is valid. And, uh, you know, it, this is going to be a cool discussion to kind of kick off where I'm coming from as a teacher and also some art principles. And, you know, we'll do some learning here in this in the next hour. So, Jonathan, did you have anything you wanted to kick off with? No, go ahead, Marco. It's all yours. <laughs> oh, OK. There you go. Okay. So essentially, I think what I want to do with the class is I want to give you guys tools to understand um, color and light. It's because it, that is really the fundamental of painting, right? Is understanding value. And from value, we get into color. And what and what that is, is a capturing of light, you know, light is kind of everything. Um, so I find that painting is quite a different experience from from drawing in the sense that it, painting still is drawing, okay? Like you have to be able to draw to be able to paint. But when we paint, we're less concerned with, with the line of something. So I have Photoshop open here, as you can see. So, you know, if you're drawing, you might be like, okay, well, here's, oops, uh, there we go. If you're drawing, you might be like, okay, here's a, you know, a little man. And I've, I've just drawn him with, with lines, right? Well, with painting, you're kind of thinking about that, but you're also thinking about shapes in a different way. You're breaking them down to say like, okay, where, where is the light coming from? Like if I'm painting this guy, I need to know like maybe the light's coming from up here, right? And that's going to create shapes within shapes. I'm talking about value right now. And what value is, is just the light and dark. So you've all seen these value scales, right? Where you have like the darkest value to like the next darkest value to, you know, a, a mid-tone and something a little lighter than that, you know, like that, and then white. Um, kind of a five value sort of system. And generally speaking, what a painter does is a painter thinks both in terms of, uh, in terms of a silhouette, like I've drawn here, and also then thinks of shapes within shapes. And what I mean by that is if the light's coming from here, we got to start thinking about where does the light create light versus shadow families okay so you know what i'm going to show you guys some paintings before i get it before i continue this crude drawing because it's better to see actual actual work so let, let's look at some stuff this is a good intro to some of the stuff i do as well um you know here's a painting 
that on the surface of it looks maybe fairly complex. It looks um, colorful and nice with some light in it and some, some interesting colors. But really what I'm, what a painting like this consists of is sound use of the fundamentals of painting uh, and, and value and color, um, value and color are really all I'm thinking about. And, and if you can control fundamentals, you will find that you can create images that have a complexity that looks like you're doing something more advanced than that. So I'll, I'll, I'll explain as I go. Let me, let me pull up some more stuff just to give you guys a sense of what I do um, as an illustrator. You'll see a lot of these paintings with this uh, monster character. He's kind of a favorite of mine to just paint in, in all kinds of different situations. As you can see, I'm really interested in, in the lighting of things, uh, art directing with strong uh, light decisions. Uh, and therefore color because you know light drives color without light there is no color so when i say light i'm also saying color um let's pull up a few more here let's see i do work in uh, children's books a lot this is one of those illustrations yeah so as you can see a lot of uh, decisions of staging via via the lighting, really. Now, um, so I, I, I kind of started off um, on this value thing with this crudely drawn character. And you know what? I think what I want to do is um, let's simplify this even more. Let's keep, let's keep open an illustration. Let's keep this one open. And let me just scale this window back so you can see it. Or, whoops. Levels on it a bit. Okay, so let's keep this open. And we are going to use this as kind of a test subject to refer back to uh, with regards to the fundamentals because this painting is really just an execution of the fundamentals uh, with, some, with some sugar on top. Uh, let's, so let's go back here and let's get rid of our man drawing. Let's just make it a, a ball because a ball is maybe one of the most simple ways to understand what we're doing here. Okay. So when we have, uh, we have light, well, I'll, I'll say this is the light source. This is the sun here. And when we have light, what we're doing is we're delegating um, light versus shadow. So when the light's coming in from here, right, it's going to hit this part of the sphere, right? So this part of the sphere is going to be in light. And then the parts the light doesn't hit is going to be in shadow, right? That just makes logical sense. So light, shadow, and then there's going to be a line demarcating the termination point, let's say, of those two families. And on a sphere, that line looks something like that. It's this curved line. Now, we have our light family and our shadow family. And we have these five values. Okay, so what I'm, what I'm showing you guys here is a very simple system for understanding light and shadow. Um, so, and we're gonna use it with just five values. All you need as a painter for the rest of your life is five values. I'm gonna show you how they work. Um, so let's make a chart. Let's make our light chart and our shadow chart, okay? Um, the first thing we have to keep in mind is what I call an average shadow, okay? An average shadow is going to be this value right here to be our average shadow so i'm going to put that value in my shadow column okay and what i'm going to do and this is this is how i approach my paintings uh, this is not a theoretical demo this is how i do it and i'm going to uh, i will relate it back to you uh here once we get into it but i'm going to take my shadow value okay and um i'm going to just fill my shadow shape with that value okay I'm not going to spend time making pretty brush strokes or anything like that. I'm just going to fill this shape with this value. I'm using a, the basic brush. If, if any of you are wondering about Photoshop brushes and stuff, just hold those thoughts for a bit. This is the most basic kind of demo there is in the sense I'm just using this kind of marker brush. There's nothing special about it. So anyway, I'm just putting this average shadow value here. Let me just erase this L letter here. Um, I'm also going to create a cast shadow, which 
you know, the shadow the sphere casts on the table just with the same value. So everything is masked into one. And what we have here is a graphic representation of the light, just two values. And this is very good starting point because it keeps everything simple. Just two values. It's easy to understand. It already looks slightly 3D, like we're getting there. Uh, and I haven't done anything really, except for just determine where there's light and where there's shadow and just put in an average value, right? Um, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a very powerful value called a half tone. And a half tone is um, this value here. Um, and now that I'm at this stage of the demo, I think it's important to tell you that in the light and shadow families, the light gets three values. It gets these three and the shadow gets two values. So I'm going to put in light, I'm going to put my lightest value, which is just white. Then I'm gonna put my halftone value, which let's just say is this value here. And, uh, oh, sorry, that's, sorry, that's not the halftone. The halftone is this one. This is average light, and I'm going to get into that. Um, so, and shadow gets two values. Shadow gets average shadow and a dark accent, which is the darkest thing in the painting. Okay, so this is the this is the delinea delineation of the five values. I've only used average shadow so far. Now I'm going to go use half tone, and half tone, as I have said, is is this one here. It's the darkest value in the light. It's called a half tone, and what a half tone is responsible for is bridging the gap between light and shadow. Okay, so a half tone exists in the light family, which is in here, right? The light family. And it's going to bridge this gap, this uh, gap between light and shadow. So what it does, you just kind of lay it down. Obviously, it's lighter than the average shadow because it's in the light family, right? Every value in the light family has to be lighter than the values in the shadow family. That's just a rule you can rely on any realistic type of painting, you need uh, to rely on that rule. Any value in the light is lighter than any value in the shadow. That is a rule of art, one of the few, but it is. And then what you can do with this value, this halftone value is you can create edges, um, soft edges. And what I'm doing, I'm just using the brush very softly on my Wacom tablet here. And I'm just kind of creating an edge on either side of the value. Very crudely, I'm, I'm purposely keeping this crude. There are no tricks. Um, and I'm just making a, a soft value. Now what I can do is I can use my average light, which is this one, average light, and I can put that anywhere in the light that's not halftone. So I can um, just grab it and start painting it in, maybe a little lighter. And I'll get rid of my outline because of course in, in painting and in real life, uh, there are no actual outlines, right? Uh, so we are we are kind of distancing ourselves from the construct of drawing linearly when we paint. And uh, we are filling in our lines with values. That is the essence of painting. Now, uh, I have my, um, my halftone value butting up against my average light value. So I'm gonna create edges just by sampling my halftone and you know, working it in, I'm kind of sculpting with this value just to create a soft edge, right? just to, to, my, to my taste, really creating a soft edge. And then I can, of course, clean up my sphere. This is a beautiful digital paint. It's easy to just clean things up. I can also uh, take my shadow value and just maybe put it in the background just to help chop out, carve out that sphere. This is a classic oil painting technique, just to play light against, well, not oil painting, any painting, play light against dark, dark against light, right? Mm -hmm. So I can do that. And then now um, I have a, a form that's starting to look quite 3D. Uh, and now I can just, I have two values left if for those who are keeping track. I have my, um, my darkest value, which is this. And I have my lightest value, which is that. And I kind of think of those as kind of inversions of themselves. One is a highlight. The highlight is simply white in this case. It's going to go right there. It's just going to catch that little pinprick of light that we're all familiar with when we see shiny objects like a an apple or something. Actually, many objects have highlights. It's just the characteristic changes based on the material of the object. Um, and then in the shadow, I have my darkest value. I kind of think of this as an inverted highlight. It's called a dark accent. What a dark accent is, it's kind of the place where the, the fewest light rays can hit. 
And what that always is, is the intersection between one surface and another. So like if this ball is sitting on a table, you're gonna get a dark accent right at the bottom where the fewest amount of light rays can, can be. I, I once heard an analogy and I, I don't know who told me this, but you guys might've heard it. Like think of you have a bunch of basketballs in a gym and the basketballs represent light rays and you throw those basketballs against the corner where two walls meet. Well, the most basketballs are going to hit the open walls, right? The fewest basketballs are going to hit the corner of the wall because it's such a condensed space. So I kind of think of these basketballs when I paint and where the fewest basketballs will hit are going to be the intersection between these two surfaces. I don't know why they're basketballs, by the way. <laughs> I, I didn't make it up, um, but it works. So you get this dark accent where the basketballs don't hit, right? And you're going to get it right in here. And of course, I'm, I'm making edges. Um, my taste, right? And, and there you go. Those are just five values that I've used there to create a, uh, you know, a convincing dimensional rendering of a sphere. I apologize for the boxiness of the sphere, but um, that's just how I paint sometimes. So now what I want to do is, you know, without any further ado, I want to transition that into color because color really, really confuses a lot of people because all of a sudden when you're dealing with color, there's this fear there's this kind of, uh, Im like kind of inference that all of a sudden you're dealing with a different beast. Like, oh, I don't understand color. How do you choose the right colors? And I can't get my colors looking right. This is, these are questions I get a lot as a teacher. And like I said, I've taught for about a decade now. So I I've heard so many questions over and over about color. And, and the <laughs> biggest one is, how do you choose the right colors? And my answer is always, it's not about choosing color. It's about choosing value first and then plugging color into that value. So I had to do this demo of black and white because I'm sure a lot of you guys um, maybe share that fear of color. And, and to be honest, I had it too years ago when I started. I was afraid, of, I was deathly afraid of color when I started. Um, oh yeah, same here, man. Yeah, it, it's because it, it's such like, you know, especially with digital, you open up this color picker that we're all familiar with. I mean, mm -hmm. look at all these colors, right? There are, there are I don't know, are there millions? I don't know. There are, there are <laughs> at least hundreds of thousands of colors that you can choose from. So I understand the trepidation, right? Like, how do you possibly know which one is right? And I think that's the first kind of error that everyone, that we all make, including myself, is that we think there is a, quote, correct color. And there really is not. It's, it's correct value first. And I've just shown you how there can only, that, how you can use only five values and come up with something that looks correct, right? So with color, let's start looking at this with color. Okay, what I'm gonna do now is I'm just going to uh, make a new layer and fill this layer with white. So I still have my original value uh, study underneath if we wanna refer back to it, but for now I'm gonna make a new layer with color. And we're just gonna look at this monster cre uh, character here. And I apologize as I kind of uh, play Tetris with my screen. I just want you guys to be able to see everything. In fact, I'm gonna hide my layers because you don't need to see that. I'm not going to be painting on any layers. I'm just going to make a, uh, a quick outline here. Uh, maybe I'll paint a little larger. I'm purposely painting small though, because I want to move fast. And honestly, this is part of uh, production. I'll show you more examples of production work right after this, uh, where I've used these techniques, but I'm going to recreate this in all its color very quickly. And I'm going to show you how I apply the exact lesson I just taught you with the five values uh, to color. Okay, so first thing I do is like I did with my sphere, I, I do a quick drawing, right? And the drawing is very, very crude. This is the cave entrance. The monster character is, is here. And um, I'm purposely keeping the shapes incredibly loose because I want freedom to change it later. This is a psychological thing where if you keep your painting loose at first, it kind of helps you be the boss of the painting because you feel like you can always change it. You can kind of command it where if, is if I zoomed in, right? If I zoomed in and like painted every little detail, um, drew every little detail, I would feel like constricted by it, right? Mm. So keep it loose. And I'm just gonna block in some uh, basic, just a, this is nothing. This is just me killing the white of the canvas like I, I, I like to do sometimes. Sometimes I'll even get out like uh, weird brushes and just put in random nonsense, but I won't, I won't get too caught up in that. Let's get back to the meat and potatoes of this. This is the monster character. 
okay? And uh, his eyes are gonna go here. By the way, again, guys, if there's any questions, feel free to interrupt and I will address them as I go, okay? Um, it's hard for me to see the chat as I'm painting. That's why we got Jonathan here, who's gonna help us with the questions. So the monster character looks like that, right? And then this is all, this is all sky, this is all cave. We have our monster. Now, if you look at my final illustration, right? Let me just full screen it here. If you look at my final, you can see how I've chosen an interesting lighting situation, or at least I've tried to. I didn't um, light him just top down. I have him hidden in this cave, okay? And let's just break this down before I go to paint it. This will help us understand what I'm doing. So we have our light and shadow families first. That's always what I think of first, light and shadow. This is a one light source setup. The sunlight is the light source. The light, uh, I'll just label it. There's light, there's light, there's light on the ground here. No, let's circle them, light, 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 and shadow. The whole monster, the whole cave, this, this area I'm scribbling over, this is all shadow. Every part of this is shadow, right? So what I ha have here is a simple idea of the separation of my light and shadow families, okay? And I, I, and I determine that very quickly. So that means, going back to my, my value uh, study, which I just need my layers window real quick. Uh, sorry guys, layers. Um, going back to this, I know based on my decisions of light and shadow, I know where my values go. Okay. It's a very simple yet powerful, um, conclusion that I can make early. Where do my light and shadows go? So what I, the first thing I do is let's, uh, let's figure that out. So let's make this light. Light's going to go here. I'm just replicating the lighting of, of my, uh, you know, of my sketch, right. Of my actual illustration. And this is all going to be light here. I'm going to ignore the, the boy character and I'm just going to focus on this stuff. Okay, so I have my basic idea of light and shadow. This, what I've just drawn on the left here, is often how I'll begin my ideas. Very, very crude, but the information is there for me to go with. I would never show a client that sketch. It's not a pretty sketch, but there are some critical decisions made already, and namely the light and shadow where the light and shadow goes. Now I'll start plugging in color, okay? And this introduces a color concept that we've all heard of uh, called warm versus cool. I think we've all heard of warm colors and cool colors, right? And really what you're doing as a painter is you are pitting these colors, I'm gonna say against each other, but really what you're trying to do is you're trying to make them work in harmony with each other. And what you, how you do that is you control where they go. And I'm gonna kind of show you a, a quick idea of how I determine that. The, um, it, it's all based on your light source. So in this case, it's sunlight, right? The sun is the light source and the sun is a very warm light. It's a yellow light, as we all know, it's orangey yellow, you know, maybe red sometimes, but let's call it an orangey yellow light. Uh, maybe in this family in here, if I were to pick in Photoshop, this is kind of sun colors, right? So these are gonna be what I'm gonna call my warm colors anything in here, anything close to this family are, are going to be my warms, my family of warms. And then in shadow, anything on the opposite end are automatically going to be cooler because they're on the opposite side of the spectrum, right? But also there are ways to other ways to create cools, but I'll get into that as we go. And of course, my class, uh, the art of color and light on CGMA will be really focused, like we're going to get we're going to get deep with this stuff in the class. But in this demo, I'm just going to show you kind of a, a quick way to think about it. Let's start blocking in color. I like to start just like I did with my sphere. I like to start with my shadow colors. So let, let's just pick a, a average shadow, right? If you remember the sphere, average shadow first. So what I like to do with my average shadow, let's say somewhere around there. The reason I'm picking it there is because I'm making a value decision. I'm not making a color decision yet. I'm making a value decision. The value is going to be somewhere in here which allows me to go very much darker if I want. And it gives me a ton of room for lights, right? So somewhere in here. And it's, um, it's going to be a shadow color. Uh, let's, just, let's just pick this one. Honestly, let's just pick a color like this and, and see where it takes us. And I'll explain a little bit of the theory behind this color in just a second. But for now, just follow me as I block this in. And I'm gonna paint right over my lines. I'm painting on one layer. There are no layers being used, just, just one layer. 
I'm painting right over my lines. And again, guys, this is going to be a, um, a quick approximation of the final, right? I'm not going to, I'm not trying to replicate it because it, it, it would take hours, right? So let, let's just get this color in. And again, feel free to interrupt with, uh, with questions. There's, uh, there's some questions for you, Marco. Oh, hit me, hit me. All righty. So these are from Michelle and Philip. Okay. I notice you have a very large list of tool presets for brushes. Yeah. How do you decide to use them? Ah, okay. They appear so, to be based off of traditional brushes. Bouncing off of Philip's question, do you feel that traditional painting helps with your digital painting more? Yeah. Okay. So the second part of that question about traditional painting, I'm just going to, I'm going to shelve that for just a few minutes. I'll get there right after this demo. It's a great question, but I will get there. Uh, I promise. The first question about tool presets. Uh, you're right. I, I do have a bunch of tool presets. Honestly, a lot of it is just junk that I haven't cleaned up yet. I've collected brushes over my, you know, many years of painting and I'm too lazy to go through them and clean them up. <laughs> I honestly, you see how, if, I don't know if you can read my screen, the, the text is small, even on, even in real life, but I have them listed as fave, uh, as in favorite. So fave, watercolor flat, fave, watercolor round. And I have a list of, let's say, there might be 15 to 20 favorite brushes here. I've done that as a quick, crude way of uh, arranging my brushes into what I like, because it's listed alphabetically. So if I put fave, all the Fs are listed in order. So I have an oil brush, a marker. I kind of have the general basis covered between oil brushes and uh, watercolor type brushes and, you know, drawing brushes, round brushes. And the way I choose them is I just try and keep up variety. Uh, I will talk about variety more in a second. I want to just for now, let's get back to the fundamental of a uh, color here and let's just go through this. So I've picked this green color, right? Now what I want to do is let's pick a warm. An, so that's my average shadow and I've plugged in this color. Okay. I just picked that arbitrarily. Okay. It's actually not even really matching my illustration. I picked it arbitrarily, but now I have to make a color temperature decision. And what I mean, what I mean by color temperature is warm versus cool. I've picked this color as my average shadow color because it's sunlight. And you guys follow me for a second because it's sunlight and sun is a warm color. That means in shadow, it's going to lack the warmth of the sun. Therefore, it's going to be cool. Okay, did everyone follow that? When you have a warm mm -hmm. light, you have cooler shadows. That's, it's another kind of thing you can follow. The reverse is true. When you have a cool light, you have warmer shadows. But the sun being a warm light means I have cooler shadows. So now the question is, how do I know what's warm versus cool? Well, I picked this color in shadow. By itself, this means nothing because there's no context. Color needs to work in context. And we call these palettes. A context of color is a palette. So I'm, I'm going to start building a palette. I have this color in shadow. Now I'm going to say to myself, okay, what is the warm version of that green? This monster is green, right? So what's the warm version of that green that the sunlight would make? And honestly, it is so simple. I'm, all I'm going to do is say, well, the sun is, I said, is this, these colors in here. So I'm going to pick my shadow color. I'm just going to move my color, my hue picker toward the warms, what I've termed as warm. And I'm just going to raise the value to my average light value, which is that all, this was all, this is almost mathematical, not quite, but I'm going to pick a color like there. So average light, meaning in that, in terms of value, it's in this family, right? My average shadow, as you remember, was in this family. My average light is going to be much lighter and warmer. And I'm going to plug that in. And all of a sudden, I've, I now instantly, this painting is now a relationship of color. I have a genuine relationship of color going on from warm here in the light to cool in the shadow. Now, from here, I am, I'm, I'm starting to stack blocks now. I'm stacking pieces together now. Uh, I'm going to now think of some var varieties. Now, I'll show you how this works. This is pretty cool. Within a color this green to, to make it less boring right now. It's just two colors. It's kind of boring, right? Before I even put in any other values, I can like, I'll show you how malleable color is. I can change this. I can add some without changing the value. I'm just adding some oranges. Can this is, this is subtle because I haven't changed the value. I'm just changing the color. I can add some, even some more orange oranges um, that are the same value, but it's all going to be appropriate. 
like I said, there is no right color. It's only appropriate color based on your value. I'm, I can plug in different colors here. It's all going to look okay as long as I stick in the warm colors. Okay. Now let, let's get back to value and let's add another value. Let's make this start really popping out. Okay. Let's add a half tone, just like I did with the sphere. I'm adding a half tone. Um, let me go back to the sphere to remind you all. Um, let me get my red marker out so I can show you. Uh, so in my monster illustration so far, I have added a average shadow, which if you guys remember was this, this is the average shadow. I've added an average light, uh, sorry, which if you guys remember, the average light was this. Now I'm gonna add the half tone, which is this. The half tone, if you recall, bridges the gap between light and shadow. So let's get into it. Let's quickly add this. And you know what, just for fun, to address the previous question, I'm gonna pick a watercolor brush. And I'm going to uh, pick my light Sample my light, sample my shadow. So there's my range, right? My light family's here. My shadow family starts around there. So I know I have to be lighter than this, but darker than that for my half tone. So I'm gonna go pick a color, maybe slightly warmer and slightly darker. Um, I've noticed that um, at half tones, often they, they warm up in temperature. I don't quite know why. Uh, sometimes they do though. And you know what? That watercolor brush is wrong for the task. So I'm gonna switch to a oil brush. This is a little, a little better. And I'm going to bridge the gap between light and shadow. I also realized that I, my shadow families, uh, there's another part of the monster that's in shadow, of course, it's the part underneath him. This is shadow. So I've sampled my shadow color. And that shadow also goes there, right? And now I'm, I'm gonna go back to my half tones. And I'm just making edges by controlling the pressure of my Wacom brush. I'm just, uh, you can, I'm pushing alt and I'm sampling color and I'm making edges, but you can see I'm starting to get a form showing. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to um, put in the, I'm going to apply the same theory to the cave, the cave itself. The cave also has its own averages, but the cave is a much darker material, the dark stone material. So um, I'm going to pick an average shadow color. Again, let's go arbitrary with it. Let's pick this grayed down red. Now you might think of red as a warm color, but if you gray something down, it actually is another way of making a cooler color. So I'm gonna gray this red down and put it behind the monster. It's like I did with that dark value behind the sphere, right? And I'm gonna create an average shadow for the cave. This is my average shadow. And of course I uh, erase the monster's arms. Let's put those back. <laughs> average shadow and you can see again how crude the drawing is that's okay we're, we're dealing with form here um now we're starting to go places Let, let's speed through the process pick an average light for the cave that's the average shadow i can maybe make my light up here okay average light a little lighter okay let's uh do the same thing for the ground the ground has a similar kind of light and again, I'm, I'm picking a color based on my sunlight colors. You can see I'm in this range of my sunlight colors. And I'm just going to put in a, a color for the ground. And uh, while I'm here, let's just block in the sky, which is just a, a you know, light, bright blue. Let's put that in. This is going to start driving some color decisions. Okay, so there we go. And let's get back to the monster. Let's uh, just block in some his eyes are a little lighter, right? They're still in shadow, but they're a little lighter shadows. Let's just block in some eyes here. Some eyeballs. Okay, so we're, uh, let's get back to some value discussions here, okay? Um, the shadow, the shadow is still my average shadow, but with color, we have this cool thing called uh, reflected light. And what reflected light is, it exists <clears throat> in your average shadows, but um, it's kind of this thing that happens when colors bounce around. And when you have a shadow, the only reason shadows are not black, like if you've seen uh, photos in outer space, the shadows are always pitch black. The reason is because there's no bounce light in outer space. So we have black shadows. But here on, on Earth, we have a uh, bounce light. And what bounce light is responsible for is something very important. It means we can see into the shadows. So I'm going to pick 
my average shadow color. And from here, I have a whole playground of bounced light to work from. And it's always gonna be a little cooler than the warm lights. Remember my sunlight is here. I can't compete with the sunlight in the shadow because that would violate my, my warm versus cool temperatures. But if I say pick this skylight, right? The sky is going to be streaming into the painting. And let's, let's bring this guy back. You can see the reasoning behind some of my color decisions. The sky being blue is coming in and illuminating the parts of the monster that are going to be facing the sky. So like this area here faces the sky. So you can see I've influenced it with a bluer color, right? <clears throat> Very logical, actually. It's, it's not scientific, really. It's just, um, well, it is, but it's just more of a logical decision. So I'm going to take this average shadow color. Let's, let's manipulate it more toward the blues. And you can, uh, you can play a little bit within your average families and you can put in some, some skylight. And I'm just going to block this in, in areas I think might receive some of that skylight, right? Coming in this way. So where I think areas might receive that, I'll just put it there. Of course, beneath the monster would not receive light, blue light from the sky, but it would receive warm light bouncing up from the ground. Light would come in like this, right? It would come in from the sun. It would hit the ground and bounce up <clears throat> into the bottom of the monster. And of course, look at the final illustration. You can see how I've applied it. Warmer light coming into the shadows from the ground. This is, I would pick my average shadow again to get a base reading of where I'm at. Maybe manipulate it a little warmer, not too warm, a little bit like this, and then just sticking within my shadow family, right? Putting in some of this reflected light. Maybe you might get a bit of this on this side as well. Okay. Um, you can just play with this kind of stuff. And uh, dark accent wise, I haven't, I haven't put any dark accents in yet. Um, I'll get to that. The, like, for example, a mouth is a dark accent. So you can, you can kind of block in this, this mouth. Every material has its own uh, five value system, right? So the cave being a separate material from the monster gets its own five value consideration. So meaning I can make the cave overall darker. I can shift everything darker in the cave, but I'm still thinking about those five values. The monster is a bit lighter than the cave because his fur is a light green. So I'm using five values for the monster, but I'm, you know, it's, it, he exists in his own context. Does that make sense? So the cave's average shadow is here. The monster's average shadow is there. Slight value difference because they're two different materials. But it never gets more complicated than those five values. Of course, there's a cast shadow on the ground from the monster. Uh, cast shadow, uh, again, let's sample the ground in light. And let's, uh, let's make a cooler color, bring it down for some shadow. And oops, that's not the right one. And then block this in for the shadow. And you can see... Um, how using these decisions, you can start arriving at some interesting color stuff. Now, um, if I wanted to take this further, I can, um, if you look at this illustration here, you'll notice the cave itself has its own uh, dark accents and reflected light. So for example, this area in here, the dark accent, because if you think of the basketballs, Fewer basketballs are going to be able to hit this area. If you threw basketballs right into this scene, fewer would hit here. More basketballs would hit here. So you're going to get a little more reflected light in here. So again, I can um, sample the cave. Might get some blue from the sky again and this in. Okay. Um, and then the dark accent, of course. Being the darkest thing in the painting, let's go down there. You can just start blocking in where the basketballs <laughs> wouldn't hit, you know. Um, you can start getting uh, interesting relationships of color, okay? So let's, um, let's look around at some illustrations and see. Uh, and by the way, I haven't forgotten the question I said I'd get back to about traditional work. I, I still promise I'll get back there. Is there anything else, Jonathan, that I've missed while I was speaking? Mm -hmm. There's a couple questions. Okay, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, we have a couple uh, relating right now to this painting from Paul. Does each material have its own five colors for each value level? 
Yeah. So um, let's um, let me rephrase the question slightly. Each each material has its own five value consideration. Okay. So for example, let me let me go back to my uh, sphere here. Okay. Actually, let me let me do something entirely different. Maybe make a new layer. So right. Okay. So now I'm going to show you something here. Let's let make an environment. This will last only a minute, I promise. One sphere is going to be made of this material, which is pretty light. Another sphere is going to be made of this material. Let's just, let's just pretend these two spheres are made of felt, and one felt is light and one felt is dark. Okay, So both spheres are going to get its own five value consideration, but because one of the spheres that's made of felt is a lighter felt, like a white felt, its five values are universally lighter than this sphere's five values because they're made of two different materials. So this sphere might have an average light here. Its average shadow might be here. Okay. And then this sphere, average light is here. Th this sphere's average light is, this, is similar to this sphere's average shadow, right? So this sphere is gonna have an average shadow that's much darker. Right? Now I'm going to um, make my environment a little lighter. Oops, push the wrong button. So I can put in a cast shadow. So yeah, you're you're always considering the local kind of lightness of your objects, right? Then the cast shadow, you know, would go in. Cast shadow is the same in this case because it's the same table that they're both sitting on. And then of course each one's going to have a highlight. I'm doing a very quick job here, but it looks like both of them in the same space because you're applying the five values to each one. Now, of course, there's dark accents, right? And you notice I've, when I talked about reflected light, when you put in that dark accent, you'll notice that the average shadow kind of takes on this reflected light quality. Um, you have all of a sudden, you have a uh, room to play in the shadows with color um, because, is there a question, Jonathan? Mm -hmm. uh, we have a question in relating to that from Kerr. Okay. How do you know how much reflected color you should be adding? Is there any rule of thumb or is it based merely on experience and or observation? Yeah, so I would say that's a very good question. That is based purely on taste. So if, let's look at this painting here. And I, I, wish I should bring up some different art so you guys don't get sick of just these two pictures. But if you look at this picture, let's just crop it actually, just so we don't get confused. Let's make this grayscale first. And I'm harping on values, guys, because uh, like I said, the question of what color is the right one, it's really about values. Okay, so value first and then color. So if you look at this, um, it's uh, the only light is this part right here. This is the only light on this monster. It's coming in from the back. I've limited, uh, I've chosen that as a interesting, hopefully interesting aesthetic to light this guy. Light there and then this is all shadow, right? So the question is, the question was, um, how do you determine how much reflected light to put in, in the colors and stuff? Again, I just wanted to show you guys the values first. Light, light, shadow, shadow. Um, and then with, of course, within shadow, I have a full range of play with reflected light. There's, there are not many dark accents in this painting. There's, of course, the mouth is a big dark accent, you can see, and maybe the eyeballs are dark accents. But getting back to color, with my value decisions made, light being here, and, and my warm light, of course, is lit by the sun again. And you'll notice I've chosen my warm light to be a little limier here, like greener, kind of a more limey color. And then my shadows, my cooler shadows, are away from that liminess, more into the turquoisey greens, okay? And um, I've, I'm just making decisions of, of color based on what the environment is. Because like I said, shadows get their color. Actually, I didn't say this. Shadows get their color from the environment. So in my, um, in my quick demo with the monster, I was showing you how the sky can influence some reflected light. And that is true in any outdoor painting. You're going to get a lot of reflected light from the sky. So you notice I'm going a little bluer. Let me get my color picker out. As I sample up here, notice I'm getting close to the blues, kind of the more aquas and turquoisey greens almost getting into some pure blues. And in fact, if I wanted to, let's go into some actual blues and put them in. And you can see that they work. 
as I paint those blues in, they work because it comes from the sky. And as long as my value is right, as long as I'm in shadow, it works. Now, if I broke my value rule, like here's a value that's too light. I put that in, this doesn't work because all of a sudden I violated my values. But if I use that same color, let me, un let me actually undo that. If I use that same color, but just in the correct value, it works because it's a, it's a blue light motivated from the sky and it's fine. Uh, it's appropriate. So let's look at some other colors I've chosen in this painting, specifically in the shadows. I always start with uh, my average shadow, which uh, if you recall from my, my quick demo was, uh, you know, that kind of base green there. Did the same thing here. It just, when I spend hours on a painting, I can really get articulate with how I weave in colors. And that's kind of how I think about uh, color use. I think of uh, literally weaving, like kind of, I mean, I don't weave baskets. I don't know what I'm talking about, but um, <laughs> you, you're weaving colors together. So if you look at the eyes, there's a bit of orange here for the eyes because, um, you know, maybe there's a little more like blood and I've done a lot of life drawing and this might ramp into the question about plein air painting from life. I just noticed that, you know, when there's eyes, you have more blood vessels. So I'm going to motivate some color moving into the oranges. But as you can see, the value, as I sample around, look what's, even though those colors are bouncing around, look what isn't bouncing around. And that's the general value range. Okay. So I know that as long as I'm within the right value range, I, I kind of have this like safe zone of value. I can pick like, any color. I can go down to these reds maybe maybe a bit extreme, but I can look at this. I can put these pinks in the painting. And as long as I pick spots that I think are appropriate, I can, I can do it. It works. I, I, you know, if I were to paint this painting today, maybe I would use some of these pinks in there. It, it's based on how I felt the day I painted it. Okay. So I think that fields that question. Um, let's, let's look at some more paintings. Um, let's, uh, uh, Marco, I have a yeah, quick question. Uh, it's going to, play off of one of Paul's questions. Yep. Is there a reason why you picked the average shadow first? Yeah, the reason I picked the average shadow first is because it covers the biggest amount of space. That's a very good question. Um, so let's go back to my sphere painting uh, here. If you recall, the first thing I did, and I can just recreate this really fast, um, add my, my sphere, right? Sorry. <laughs> and the first thing I determined was light and shadow. And the first thing I did was I put in that average shadow. And the question was, why do I pick average shadow first? And the answer is simply because it covers the most space. Uh, it, it gives me the most information because it gives me the biggest amount of um, space in the picture filled up. Painting, like I said, uh, with color is a matter of um, relating colors together. It's also a matter of relating values together. So the more physical space I can cover on the canvas, the quicker I can do that with an intelligent theory behind it. In this case, average shadow, average shadow, average light. That means the quicker I can start seeing if this painting is going to work. Um, because think of it as a jigsaw puzzle. I've just put a very large jigsaw puzzle in, in place here. Not only one, but two. Because I put down an average shadow, I also now have an average light, right? I've created an average light just by virtue of placing my average shadow. Um, I know a sphere is a simple object, but I've hopefully shown you how even in a more complex object like these, how an average light and average shadow will really help inform the painting just by virtue of covering space on your canvas. So that's why I do it. Of course, the last thing I would ever do is zoom in and paint detail because detail covers the least amount of space. Um, let's, let's zoom out. Uh, let's undo here and zoom out and let's look at this painting. Uh, let's look at the other areas of this painting. Okay. If you look at the bridge, just like the monster, the bridge is, is actually mostly in shadow. The only light is hitting, uh, is hitting this area here. The only light hitting that bridge, this mm -hmm. whole bridge is in shadow, which means I have a playground of reflected light and color. You know, when I say, remember when I say light, I mean color, reflected light, reflected color to play with. And you'll notice this bridge benefits from a whole ton of different kind of colors. Now, 
because this is a more uh, caricatured, let's say, illustration, meaning I'm not trying to be realistic. I don't want you to look at this and say, think it's a real bridge. I want this to be heightened, like a, you know, think of a Pixar movie or something. I want this to be a heightened reality. So I'm playing with colors a little more than you would see in real life. Like I'm picking purples next to greens, but I'm keeping them cooler based on their grayness. Um, so let, let me, let me jump around with, with that concept. Let's look at this green here. I've sampled the green in light. Notice how saturated it is. I can use that same family of green in shadow, but to keep it cooler, I'm just going to gray it down a bit. So I'm going to sample this now and you'll notice how my hue didn't shift. So there's the hue in light. That's, gr that's grass in light. Here's bridge in shadow, very similar hue, but I've grayed down the color, which means I've cooled it down in my mind. Grays are cooler. So if I have this saturated warm, I just got to cool it down. And as long as I'm in the right value family, I've got a cooler version of the light, uh, a cooler version of that green that I can use. And then of course, I'm, I've got actual cool colors like these blues. And because blue is so much more opposite than the greens, I can go a little more saturated with it, right? And, and I, can, I can, if I you know, painted that around with the smudge tool here, I love the smudge tool, by the way, because it allows, it allows um, me to paint in like almost like oil paint. So I use a smudge tool a lot in my work. Um, kind of gives me edges for free almost, just like real oil brush would give me natural edges. Yeah, so I can paint this blue in, you know, I, I'm, I'm in these really uh, obviously cool colors now. But the second I wanted to say put a, a warmer cool in, so kind of sounds uh, like a paradox, a warmer cool, but it exists. Uh, all I have to do is gray it down a little bit. So I'll show you the wrong choice. If I pick this red, which is warm, and I did this, notice how it's too warm. Can you guys kind of see that? That color is kind of too warm for the space. But check this out. All I have to do is gray that down. Let's pick a, a more subdued version, a more grayed version. And all of a sudden, it fits, right? It, it's, mm -hmm. it's got that property of coolness, even though it's a warmer color, right? So, so painting is, is this um, play between knowledge of how light works in terms of like warm versus cool and you get a lot of that from observation and i will show you observation studies in a second and, and it's a play between that and also personal taste because uh, like i said this is a caricature of life not real life so i've been able to you know ask myself how can i you know take life and, and plus it a little bit but let's go into some before i get another question let's quickly go and look at um how i study light and this is uh, just a page of my website. If you guys go to uh, my website, which is marcobucci.com, uh, you click on the fine art link. I've called it uh, kind of a joke, finer things in quotes. I hate how art is called fine art. I absolutely can't stand that term because I don't know what's so fine about it. But, um, <laughs> but if you look at, quote, finer art, um, these are watercolor sketches from life. Um, and you can see, if you look at this one, and I'll maximize my screen, Hopefully you guys can see that this, this is a, uh, the size of this watercolor is fairly small. It's maybe an eight by 10. Um, and you can see how I'm quickly observing from real life, very basic observations of light and shadow and warm and cool. Let me um, bring this into Photoshop actually. So if I just copy that and go into Photoshop with it, we can actually analyze it. Okay. So here we are in Photoshop with this painting. I'm just going to zoom in a little bit. It might get a little pixely, but that's okay. This is watercolor from life, um, about a f maybe 40 minute painting. So if you look at that building, it's a yellow bright building. Okay. If you, if any of you guys are from Europe or have been to Europe, uh, you'll, you'll recognize this kind of architecture instantly. These, these bright yellow buildings with red rooftops. You'll notice that, uh, my, te my color temperature here is actually much more gray than my monster painting. So this is real life. So I'm trying to capture the color that's actually there. And in real life, it's very rare that you get these bright saturated colors, right? Real life is actually a lot grayer than you might think it is. So in this case, my light on the building, is actually quite gray. So, which means my shadows um, have to move into a different color space. You can see if I, as I sample this, I've gone a lot grayer. It's actually almost pure gray. And it's more closer to the reds here. And you'll probably notice if I sample around, here's some blues that are in shadow. 
okay? Um, so this is traditional media acting the exact same way as my digital paintings. It's um, the two are not different creatures. They're the same. They're just two different mediums, but you're, you're making the same choices. So relating back to my class, one of my goals with my class, the, uh, the Art of Color and Light, is I want to give people tools to use any medium. You know, uh, when I'm out painting watercolor, I'm, I feel like I'm painting digitally. I'm just mixing my colors on a palette, right? And I'm dealing with the uh, intricacies of watercolor. And then when I'm in digital paint, I'm dealing with the intricacies of digital paint. But my, my driving color decisions and value decisions are exactly the same. Those things do not change, okay? You can use gouache, watercolor, whatever medium you want, doesn't matter. You can draw with a stick in the sand and you're still using the same kind of principles. Okay, so let's, let's sample around this painting a little more. Let's look at the street. The street is a very drab gray. I mean, the street is, is lit by the sun, so it's warm. But in this case, my warm color is this gray, right? But remember, it's about the relation that matters. The street still looks like it's lit by the sun because my shadows are so much more cool, right? My shadows, as I sample, instantly pop into the blues. So if, again, this is the street in light, this very kind of ugly, greeny, gray color. But the relationship is what's important. As I go into the shadows, boom, it turns into this blue, purpley color. And as I sample around, you'll, you'll get slightly different kinds of blues, right? Um, because I'm in Photoshop right now, I can, let's increase the blues a little bit and, um, you know, paint into the shadows. And you can see that it's very appropriate. Um, with watercolor, it's a little tougher with watercolor to get these bright colors that I get digitally. So when I'm in watercolor, I'm often painting slightly grayer. But that's okay because I find that understanding grays, if you can control colors within a context of grays, and what I mean by that is, um, like I said, as I sample around, my colors are actually quite close to gray. You guys see that? They're all in this range. If you can control color when you don't have as much room as you do digitally, that is actually quite a powerful learning experience. And I've actually done most of my learning traditionally. So let's go back to my website here. And I'll just pull up, uh, not that one. Let's pull up some of these studies here. Um, they're very small because the studies themselves are very small. Um, these are all from life, just quick uh, gouache paintings in a sketchbook. Um, let me see if I have a higher res version of that. You guys Marco, I, yep. um, I have a question real quick. For, yep. for watercolors, I've noticed that they're a little harder to control for me because you can't really make things lighter. Yep because the light is just the paper. Mm -hmm. okay. So I was wondering what your process is when you're painting watercolor versus, you know, oil or gouache or color uh, mediums that you could control the white, I guess. Yeah, so with watercolor, um, you know what, I can actually kind of mimic it with, uh, with digital here. Let me just expand the canvas. Oops, let's just expand the canvas a bit and uh, just fill it with white yeah so like jonathan said with watercolor if any of you guys have tried it you, it's a subtractive medium meaning you cannot paint light over dark like you can do with digital or or oil or gouache you can paint lights over darks uh, with watercolor you have to paint from white down to dark so what i usually do is um i start with a pencil drawing which in this case is just a quick it's, i'm drawing this building right now with these trees my pencil drawing literally literally looks like this uh just a quick indication of where things are and then what I'll do, I'm just painting the buildings in this case, there's a tree here. Uh, my pencil drawing will start with that. And then I will, um, I'll actually get a digital watercolor brush out here and I can kind of mimic it. I'll start with uh, some basic washes, like, like I'll start with uh, uh, maybe a kind of yellow like this and the, the rooftops might get this red wash. Maybe the, uh, the ground gets a wash and it's all very light. And then what I, what that means is I have tons of room to go darker. So then what I'll start doing immediately is get a relationship of, um, of shadow. So essentially what I have now is kind of my average light. So instead of starting with average shadow, with watercolor, you got to start with your average lights. And I'll put in these basic colors. And then I'll pick an average shadow. So I might pick this, um, you know, if this is my average light, which is very similar to what it is in the actual painting. I might mix up on my palette this uh, purpley dark, right? And I'll start maybe a little darker and I'll start putting in this 
dark and get a sense of uh, where my shadows are at. And what, and you know, this is a tree which is casting a shadow onto the building. And uh, it's all subtractive, so I can't paint lighter. And then of course the trees, the foliage, trees are very dark. Remember I talked about each material having its own kind of five value consideration? Well, trees are very dark. So the average light of a tree might be actually quite dark. So I can block in my trees as dark objects. Hmm. And then, um, you know, get even darker within it. So again, watercolor is, it follows the rules of everything else. It's just the way you approach it is, is different. Um, it's hard to do a watercolor demo without actual watercolor. So I think I'll stop there, but basically it's just a reverse. I start with my average lights first and then mm -hmm. work darker into them. Um, gotcha. Yeah. But uh, so painting from life is hugely instructive because nature really is the best teacher in the sense that all the raw information is there. Like nature is like, um, it just shoots raw information at you. Like, like cannonballs. It just, it, it just smacks you in the face with like just raw undesigned stuff, but all the rules are there. And once you can start understanding like the five values and actually let me back up. The five values are a way of understanding nature. Okay. Nature has infinite values. We, our eyes are incredible pieces of biology that can see millions of values, right? The five values is a way for us puny humans to understand, <laughs> nature, to categorize it. Right. Um, of course, um, we don't, well, we don't need a million values to understand something. We just need, we, you know, simp simplify, uh, keep it simple. Uh, five values is all you need. So the five value system is a way of understanding nature. So for those of you who have painted from life or, or wish to paint from life, you can really take a five value approach and look outside at different objects and start understanding how they might work. Of course, sunlight is the most friendly kind of light for that. Um, in my class, we'll get into more advanced kind of lighting uh like uh let's let me pull up a painting that I, that i might consider more advanced in terms of its lighting um let's see do i have one here maybe this one uh this is a the only reason i say this is a little more advanced is only because it's less obvious what's in light and what's in shadow in fact most of almost everything's in shadow. I kind of like doing that in my paintings, kind of putting everything in a world of reflected light. Um, and the reason is because it allows me so much room to play with color. Uh, mm -hmm. If I, Let's look at, um, let me just quickly go into, sorry guys, uh, let's, let's, look at, let's look at this one. This one has both worlds in it. So this one has, uh, again, <laughs> again uh, something I like to do is I only put a little bit in light in this case, this part is in light and most of him is in shadow. And again, it's so I can play with the color and I can play with the subtle play of hues and, and warms and cools, right? The, uh, I find the, the light part, this part, is very predictable because the light is coming from this, this uh, street light, right? And whatever the street light hits, there's going to be this kind of predictable warm color. So if I sample the street light, is this and I sample the monster very close right it, it's a very simple determination of what color it is because it's, mm -hmm. it's almost literally the same color as the light but when you get into shadow that's where I have fun because the shadow you can have any color uh, not you know not any color but you can have these cooler colors that can jump all over the map based on your own personal taste and I love doing that so I love putting things in shadow because it gives me so much room with color and that's the same principle here um, it's a little more advanced I said because there are fewer guidelines maybe because I have everything in shadow. I can kind of play with so many different colors and it, it just is a, a matter of taste really at that point. Whereas <laughs> if I have something more obviously in light and shadow, um, let's look at something like this. Actually, no, let's look at, uh, let's look at hmm, this one. Let me go full screen on that. You can see what kind of motivates uh, some of my lighting decisions is, is just play with temperature. So this big beam of light is warm light and anything in there is going to be this kind of predictable yellowish light. It's the same, it's the same thing I'm rehashing over and over, honestly, in, in a lot of these. Um, this predictable kind of warm light. And then in shadow, 
In shadow, you get more play. You get you get cool turquoises and and reds and grayed down greens and stuff. Um, I get to play a lot with that. Uh, is there any other questions, Jonathan, that I've been missing? Mm -hmm. We have three questions. All right. Hit me. So the first question, uh, the most recent one, is from Tsutomu. When choosing colors, how do you make saturation decisions? Does saturation change inside the same object or material? Okay, so Satomu, hello. Um, let's look at a painting and let's field that question. Um, maybe this one. So the question was, does the saturation change within an object? Is that the, is that the question? Did I get that? Yeah, when, when choosing colors, how do you make saturation decisions? Oh, okay. And okay. does it change in the same object change. or material? Okay, uh, good, good question. And I'm trying to parse out my answer here in a clear way. So let's look at this pig. And I instinctively chose this pig because I think there are a few saturation changes here. It really depends on the relationship of warm and cool that you'd like to see. So let me expand on that. This pig, let's go to values for a second, grayscale it off. Um, to determine our values first, okay? Everything is value first. No matter what questions anyone would ever ask me, I'm always gonna go value first. So light, shadow. I'm gonna, this circle I'm drawing here, this is all light, okay, light. And then this is all shadow, okay? That's shadow and this is light. So I already know that tells me a few things. Let's go back to color. That tells me that I want my shadow, my lights to be, and actually this is a reverse. I want my lights to be cooler and my shadows to be warmer. So you can see my lights on this pig are in the more purpley reds, which I call a more of a cooler red. And my shadows are popping into the more warmer reds, kind of more oranges. Now that doesn't answer your question. Your question was saturation decisions within an object. Okay. So, I am going to sample around my lights and let's, let's look. Okay. So here's an example. If, if you look at these two samplings I'm making here, I'm sampling within the light, but there are two different saturations. So let's, let's, and let's kind of reverse engineer this painting a little bit and see what I I've done. Cause some of this stuff, honestly, because I've painted, I do a lot of painting. Some of the stuff sometimes happens instinctually. That's something that happens when you get, gain experiences. You commit a lot to your subconscious. So I actually didn't realize when I did this that I was kind of doing something you said, which is different saturation. So let's, let's analyze it. Um, the average light of this pig is, is in here, is this pinky red, okay? Which you would expect for a pig. And if you notice, I picked this really like incongruous blue that's right here. And it's kind of a weird choice, right? You might not expect there to be blue in the color of a pig. Part of that is me trying to be creative with color and be unexpected because I think unexpected is good for viewers because it keeps them on their toes and it keeps them interested. Um, but I've also changed the saturation. The inner workings of this is a, there's a saturation change. I think that's because my, my average color being this pink color, if I were to have this blue compete with that saturation, so if my, my saturation for the pinks is up here, if I were to maybe match that saturation with the, with the purple, it almost fights with it because the color is so different that I'm causing a fight. The colors are clamoring for attention. Whereas if I just say to that color, okay, I want you to be part of this painting, but I don't want you to fight with the pinks. So I'm just going to gray you down a little bit. And that somehow with some, some doing, you know, I, I undo a lot. I, I put strokes down and undo. Uh, one of the beauties of digital painting is you can do that. Um, it it, it kind of makes this color fit a little more if I've given it a slightly grayer version of itself, I kind of, I think maybe what I did there is I kind of made a hierarchy of importance and my saturated color, which is this pink has the most importance. So it was the most saturated. And then there's this blue, which I really wanted to see if I can do is like almost a personal challenge. I gave it less saturation kind of to give it, to relegate it to a lower rank of dominance. So 
um, I kind of told the viewer that the pink is what you should focus on, but the blue is just the kind of this fun thing. And, and to do that, I gave it less saturation. So that's kind of one example of how saturation can change within an object. Um, hmm. So let's move on from there. Okay. Again, um, two more questions uh, from earlier from Graham. How do you know? Um, oh, sorry, one second. Go ahead. How do you manage the difference between too loose and finished? How do you know when to stop the painting? Okay, good question. The way I do that is I think about painting as answering questions. So let me bring up these two paintings here. Um, what I have here is, if you bear with me while I find it, oh, I think it's this. Nope, not that. Sorry, guys. Uh, let me just find it because this will answer the question in a much better way. Uh, it's here and here it is. This is it. Okay. So what I have here, and this is purposefully small, on the right is the color key preliminary sketch of the final, which is on the left. Okay. So let me just close off some of these paintings so we don't get confused. Okay. So what we have, sorry guys, what we have here is um, two different paintings, but the same picture, two different versions of the same picture. So the question is, how do I know too loose versus, versus finished? And that's a kind of an appropriate question for me because I do paint quite loosely. Even my finals are quite loose. Um, I choose that as a, as an aesthetic because I personally like the look of loose paintings. I like when they involve me to participate in the viewing of the painting. Um, I just like it when an artist has that kind of uh, quality to their work. It's kind of a confidence that I think an artist can have is when they're loose yet still finished. So um, a painting for me is all about answering questions. And in the color key, which is this, uh, and this is full resolution. It's a very low res picture. It's uh, if I go image size, it's only 400 pixels wide. And that's how wide I painted it. So I'll zoom in just to give you guys online a, a better viewing of it. But you can see that this only answers the question of, um, it answers value and it answers color temperature, but that's all it answers. Okay, it does not answer exact drawing. Okay, so in this picture, and this I did this for a client. This is, a, this is part of the children's book that's gonna be published uh, this year. I showed the client this color key and I said, hey, um, what do you think of this color scheme? I kind of like, it's a, obviously a play between uh, light, um, day and night, uh, two different, it's the same character, if you read the story, it's the same character uh, reflecting on his past and um, kind of the day and night, happy and sad sort of thing of it. And I showed the client this painting and I said to him, I said, this is just for you to determine mood. I'm answering the question of mood and the client really liked this painting. so." For me as an artist, I had to say, okay, I now have to paint a finished version of this. I've already answered the question of lighting and color and value. It's all here. Now I have to recreate that, but in something I can call finished. So uh, it, I'm relating all this back to answering questions. I've already answered the question of light and value and color, but I have not answered the question of exact drawing. Okay. So when I say exact drawing, like what are the exact shapes in this dude's face? Like, what's the design? You know, uh, this, it's a big triangular shape. What are the forms actually doing? Meaning like this nose, like what does this nose actually look like? You know, in my color key, it's an illusion. It looks like it's there, but it's just a few brush strokes and it only works because it's so small. But when I actually go to an illustration, I have to say, okay, how many, how many brush strokes do I need to sell the form of that nose? And then uh, honestly, when I know it's finished when I feel like I've answered that question, like the, what are the exact forms? So, you know, if you look at the hands, they are nowhere near detailed, but there's enough there that you get, you understand what's happening. Whereas in my color key, like, look at that, I didn't even paint it because in the color key, that was not a relevant question. It was not relevant for me to know where his fingers were. But in the final, I need to know where his fingers are. So I, I put them in enough to answer the question of where are his fingers. But if you notice, it's all relative, as, as has been a theme in this chat so far. Um, the face is more finished than the hands. And that is a very conscious decision because I want you to look at his face more so than the hands. Even this character in the back, he's a little more finished than what's behind him because I want you to look more at him. 
Um, so it's all this question of relativity. Now, when I zoom in, you can kind of see a difference. But when I zoom out, it kind of kind of congeals into this, hopefully, this nice finished quality, but still loose. And the reason it hopefully looks finished is because um, I've answered that question of, of I've put things in context. I've taken the um, information of light and color from here, and then I've added it to here where I've answered a few more questions such as, you know, the exact forms I've rel related different types of brushwork together. Um, I did this uh, sketch uh, just, I uh, finished it yesterday, I think. Let me open it up real, real fast. Uh, all right. All right, guys, I got two different folders here and this is called Troop. Okay, this, this is a more realistic painting. Uh, this is not cartoony like my other ones. Uh, I did this painting uh, yesterday and this painting, I really had to ask myself that question. How do I know when it's done? Because look how sketchy it is, right? There's so much sketchiness going on. But how did I know when it's done? I, sorry, it's a horror. It's a, a scene from a horror book. So <laughs> it's kind of graphic, graphic and stuff. Um, but I just, I knew I was finished when the focal point had the most interest. I think I wanted to direct the eye here to the focal point. And I put in enough information where I said, okay, the focal point is where you're looking. Everything else is kind of relegated to second fiddle from that. And um, that was when I determined that I was finished when I had a, a focal point and uh, that was where you were looking. So, and same with this, uh, the face is the focal point. It's where you look first and there you go. Um, yeah. Is there another question, Jonathan? Awesome. Yeah. Um, I'm so sorry, guys. We probably have time for maybe just two more questions. Sure. So I'm going to answer one of Scott's questions from way back. He's asking, yeah. what is the average time it will take to do this kind of painting? I think he was referring to the green monster. Yeah. Uh, the little green monster and the kid reading the book on the bridge. Yeah, sure. So um, let's just say, uh, I don't know if I have that painting open still, but... Uh, I would say anywhere between three to six hours, um, depending on really, de it doesn't really depend on detail level. It depends on how much, how many questions I want to answer, like uh, how many focal points there are, like in this painting here, uh, this, this, this was another uh, pig painting for that children's book. Um, there are quite a few focal points um, because this is this painting happens over two pages in the book and when and this is the very first page so there are all these different spots um, like like this here this this and this these are all focal points that kind of act in this circle uh, it follows this circle and because there's so many focal points it took me a lot longer to finish this painting this is probably about 10 hours um, and I typically like to do my paintings over at least two days. So I'll do a lot of work on day one, let's say four hours, five hours, depending. And uh, then I'll stop, close it down for the day, go to sleep, come back the next day and look at it. And often what happens is you have a fresh eye on it. And all of a sudden what you think was finished yesterday is all of a sudden looking too rough the next day or vice versa. What you think is too rough might actually look pretty good the next day. And, um, the freshness allows you to make decisions. I also flip my painting a lot um, like that. And it allows me to see the painting as if it were for the first time because your brain is not used to seeing it from the re reverse angle. So I do that a lot to help me understand when I'm finished. But the, the small short answer to your question is three to 10 hours per painting. After that, I find I'm just uh, spinning my wheels. Hmm. Cool. Um, Question from Kerr, how do you know how much dark things should be? For a beginner, can I pick valley from a photograph? Thanks. Yeah, uh, how do I know how much, how many darks to use? Is that the question? Um, let me see, how do you know how much dark things should be? I guess he's asking how dark things should be and okay. if it's okay for him to pick value from a photograph. Yeah, okay, so, um, well, let's look at this painting. Let me zoom in on that. This is more of a environment study that um, I believe I had a, a some photographic reference for it, but um, mostly it's from imagination. But as you can see in this painting, there's quite a lot of darks in it. Um, and I think the answer to how dark things should be is essentially is how much contrast you want. I um, 
sometimes you sometimes I fall into the trap of things not having enough contrast. And what that means is my value decisions are too much congealed in this range, like in the middle range, or maybe too light. It just means I'm not using my full values. Now, it's certainly not required to always use full values. That is not a requirement. You don't have to do that. But if you want a nice punchy picture, like in this case, I'm using a very full range of values. Like my lightest value is way up there and my darkest value is way down there. So I'm using a full range of value. And um, I, I like to block in, I like to determine darks based on uh, compositional um, reasons. So in this painting, I don't necessarily care about what's going on here. This composition is more about this circle effect created by the light pattern, kind of this triangle slash circle sort of thing that your your eye is following. And I used darks to break up the pattern, right? So if my my lights, it's all relative. Again, they relate to each other. My lights create a circle and my darks create a linear pattern like this. So this painting is kind of this, subconscious um this shape that i've drawn with my pink brush here is kind of subconsciously what, what's making this painting work um now this is a topic composition is a topic that i haven't discussed in this um one hour talk um because it, it it's a it's a whole other bag of um bag of worms that we're going to get into with my class um but that is a, a compositional question is where and how to use darks and how dark to make things but in general, that's a good rule of thumb, compositional reasons. Nice. And um, this will probably be our last question for the interview from Jacob. What are good exercises to be proficient at color? Hmm. Good exercises to be proficient at color. You know what's a good one? Um, let's go back to the beginning. And this is actually a great question to kind of bring our uh, talk full circle. And that was no pun intended. Uh, but look at these circles on the screen here. And um, let's look at this one here, okay? This is actually a good exercise that you guys can do right now based on the information I've talked about in this hour. Um, start with these spheres, okay? Make these spheres. Value first. Um, this is a good study. Start with values and then start adding color to them. So. You know, I've used my five values to make this quick study, right? Average shadow, average light, um, dark accent. And again, if in the course, we're going to go over this and more. But um, start adding color. So let's say that, um, let's say my, my, my main light source is this bluish light. So let's start replacing our values with colors. And let's say this bluish light is going to make a slightly kind of different shadow and maybe the background is going to be uh i'm just replacing my values with colors and this is going to get you guys into the mindset of uh, value first and then plugging in color uh, with your value decisions already made and i like separating painting into stages like that and this is actually a classical oil technique where painters would put in value first and then put their color in glazes later. Now I'm not really glazing here. I'm actually op opaquely painting over it, but I'm using my same value decisions. And then maybe my half tone, you know, I, which I painted over, I'm gonna put in my half tone. And um, this is a good way of getting into color. Um, oh, there was a question before about choosing color from photographs. Um, yes, you can certainly do that, but you know what's a better way of doing that? And I'm just going to talk as I paint here before we close for the day. Um, a better way of doing that is um, is looking at a photo and sampling it, sampling it without painting. Um, I am. Do we have time? Uh, just a couple minutes, John. Yeah, yeah. Go for it. Okay. Okay. So on my screen here, uh, you, which you can't see, I'm googling uh, forest waterfall, and I'm going to bring that image into Photoshop in just a second. Okay, here's a good one. And I'm going to copy it. You guys can't see this because I'm on my other monitor, but I'm going to copy the image and paste it in Photoshop. Ah, it's super low res. <laughs> uh, one sec. Here we go. Copy. Paste. Okay, so here's a, here's a photo I just Googled of a waterfall. Okay, um, what I like to do 
and I, I actually do, I have done a lot of these studies in the past. I like to go up into a filter gallery and um, apply a dry brush filter to it, which just kills the detail. Hit okay. And you can all, you can fade it back a little bit to get some detail back. And then what I do, I look at this, like Photoshop's kind of turned this into a painting for me. And instead of painting a copy of this, I'll just open the color picker and I'll say, okay, uh, what are these colors doing? Like, what is the relationship of green in light in this photo versus green in shadow? And I'm noticing something interesting. It relates back to what I said about color. This light, this is lit by a cool light. Now we haven't talked about cool light much today, but a cool light essentially is, um, in this case, an overcast day. Like uh, when the cloud is covering the sky, that's, an, that's a cool light um, because you're getting most of the light from the gray blue of the sky, not the sun. So in this case, look at these greens on the left. As I sample the lights, notice how uh, they're in the, they're go, they wanna go towards blue, right? The greens are kinda closer, getting closer to the turquoise of greens. And then look at the shadows. Look how much warmer the shadows are, right? These are greens in shadow that I'm sampling. And this tells me that in real life, in this photograph, you have a cooler light for the green and a warmer shadow for the green. And that is important because I can now use that information in a painting. I can now, I can, you know, I can apply this lesson everywhere in this, in this photo, but I'm not gonna do any painting yet. I'm just gonna look around say, what's this, what's this value? What's this value? And how do they relate? Like, look at the log. This log in light is beautiful because there's subtle variations of color. I'm almost seeing a more purpley light here. If I zoom into this log, I'm almost seeing more purpley pixels here versus greens. And I want to just get in my mind what these relationships are in a photograph versus the shadows. And then what I can do, if I do that for say 20 minutes, I'll then load up a canvas and without sampling, I'll try and recall what I've just sampled on a new canvas and where I get into trouble, like where I forget, maybe, you know, sample the color. But the reason I recommend not sampling color and simply sample a color from a photo and apply it to a painting is because you are kind of denying yourself the ability to uh, learn anything there because you, um, it, it's almost a form of tracing, whereas you're letting kind of Photoshop do the work for you. But if you look at a photo and sample around for yourself and start looking at the trends and you know, the relationships of light and color and start internalizing them and then see if you can bring them out in your own paintings, that is a great way to study. And it's almost analogous to studying from life where in real life, you, you, know, you can't sample anything, you have to just use your eyes. So this is kind of like a precursor to that. For those who haven't done a lot of um, uh, photograph or life study, try this, load up a photograph and sample around. Apply a dry brush filter so you don't get caught up in detail. Sample the photo and then open a new canvas and see if you can recreate those relationships you've observed and um, see if you can recreate the f effect in the photo. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Marco. That was incredibly insightful and instruct instructive. Oh, thank you, Jonathan. And thanks for um, fielding the question or uh, helping me with those questions. And thank Definitely. you everyone for joining again. Um, I would, uh, I would love to see you guys in the class and uh, I will be here at CGMA for, um, for a while. Uh, we are starting the first class in October, as you guys probably know, but I will be here for the future semesters for a while. And um, we're going to have some fun with uh, color and light. And, you know, we, we scraped just the tip of the iceberg here, but but hopefully the most important tip of the iceberg is uh, kind of learning how to systematically deal with this stuff. So we're going to take this and go deep with it in the class. So hope, hope to see you guys there. Awesome. Thank you guys so much and have a great rest of your weekend. Yeah, take care. Have a good weekend, guys, and happy painting. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.